So good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of NNF Gujarat, I, Dr. Prashant Karya, Secretary, NNF Gujarat, welcomes one and all. I request President Sandeep Trivedi to welcome all the guests. Sandeep, bye. Uh, I am uh, thanks, Prashant. Uh, neonatal Partiala is a very good going program which is helpful to the uh, PG student and also pediatrician and neonatologist. I welcome my moderator, sir, Dr. Deepak Chawla, sir, and the panelist, Dr. Sridhar, sir, Ur Urvi Ben, and Dr. Mohammed, and I welcome Dr. Divyang uh, as a mod uh, chairperson of this uh, session. Thank you. Thank you, Prashant. Thank you. So, thank you so much, uh, Sandeep, yeah. for being here. So, with this, I welcome Dr. Divyang Patel. He is a chairperson for today's session. He is a consultant pediatrician in Modasa and he is an EB member of AOP Gujarat. He was a president of AOP Sabar Kanta branch. So, welcome uh, Dr. Divyang Patel. With him, we do have our experts. Dr. Deepak Chawla, who is a professor in the Department of Neonatology, Government Medical College, Chandigarh, he is going to be a moderator for today's most common topic a physiological jaundice in a newborn. His areas of interest are research methods, systematic reviews and guidelines and quality improvement. With him, we have Dr. G. Sridhar. He is MD, DM Neonatology, Associate Professor in Department of Pediatrics, Armed Force Medical Colleges, Pune. He is a Chief of Army Staff Commendation and he is having 21 publications in Neonatology and International Journals. So, welcome, sir. Uh, we do have Dr. Urvi Sangvi as a panelist. She is MD DNP Neonatology from Kochi and she is a consultant neonatologist at the Unmold Newborn Care Rajkot. She is visiting faculty at Padma Kunvarva District Hospital Rajkot and she is an NRP trainer also. With this, we have Dr. Mohammed Gandhi also as a uh, fellow in neonatology and he is working in Baroda. So with this brief introduction, I hand over the uh, panel to today's uh, expert, our Dr. Deepak Chawla, sir, for moderating the questions. We request all the participants to post the questions in the chat box, whatever they have, and that will be taken at the end by Dr. Uh, Divyang. He will ask to all our panelists. So thank you so much. Over to you, Deepak Chawla, sir. Just a minute, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Prashant, sir. Uh, sorry uh, for not uh, running the slides on time, but for neonatal partial, I would like to tell that there is no end of education. It is not that you read a book and pass an examination and finish with education. The whole of life from the moment you're born to the moment you die is a process of learning. And we have very good teachers today because teachers have three loves. Loves of learning, love of learner, and the love of bringing the first two loves together. You can teach a person all you know, but only experienced person like Today's moderator and speaker will convince him that what you say is true. So uh, today's topic is just interesting to everybody because we all are running an issue and neonatal jaundice is not so uncommon. It's the most common uh, problem for discharged patient to be readmitted in our NICU. So with this much of introduction, I would like to hand over for today's discussion, our uh, Dr. Deepak Chawla, sir. Sir, please run the program and uh, start our discussion. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Divya. Thank you very much. Can you hear my voice clearly? Yes, sir. Okay, okay. Thank you, Dr. Divya, Dr. Prashant, and Dr. Sandeep for this opportunity to moderate this session. And we have a very learned panel members with us, Dr. Gopal, Sridhar, Dr. Urbi, and Dr. Mohammed. And we'll try to cover uh, different aspects of management of jaundice. Uh, because jaundice being one of the most common mobility, uh, we see patients with jaundice on, on almost daily basis. Most of these patients can be managed, uh, you can say, in an automatic mode as you get experienced. But some patients do give uh, uh, opportunity to deeper thought and to look at what can be the cause, how to manage. So we'll, over the next an hour or so, we'll try to touch both common and uncommon aspects of uh, newborn jaundice. So we'll start with uh, my dear friend, Dr. Sridhar. Uh, so first question goes to you. 
can you throw light on the current epidemiology of jaundice so how common is jaundice uh, uh, is it truly totally the most common morbidity and uh, many time people say that with time jaundice is increasing uh, this is true for many other things people say that with time pollution is increasing kids are behaving certain way similarly people say jaundice is increasing every week we get jaundice so is there a trend that it is getting increased dr gopal please uh good afternoon sir thank you uh, nf uh, gujarat the president the secretary and uh, moderator dr deepak chabla sir for uh, this kind opportunity so uh, as we all know neonatal jaundice uh, is a very common condition that we all encounter and uh, as we have learned repeatedly almost 60% of term babies and uh, about 80% of the preterm babies have neonatal jaundice that is visible uh, in the first week of life now having said this why are we so concerned why is we so bothered about uh, jaundice it seems to be a very uh, easily treatable condition in a recent uh, paper of the lancet we have seen that the incidence of clinically significant jaundice is almost 18% of the live births and severe jaundice as defined in this paper as more than uh, potency of the more than 20 mg per deciliter as around 99 per 1 lakh uh, live births pernicious is the condition that we are all uh, wanting to prevent with this morbidity and the incidence is a gross underestimation because reported incidence just varies from 0.2 to 2.7 per 1 lakh live births so in a recent uh, systematic review published in the bmp open in 2017 they took a surrogate marker of what could reflect severe jaundice and they said since there are not many published studies the uh, acute pulmonary encephalopathy jaundice related deaths could be a surrogate marker for severe jaundice and here they identified overall an incidence of around 9.9 per 10000 live births the highest burden being seen in african and the southeast asian countries so you can clearly see africa almost 700 uh, per 1000 per 10000 live births and in the southeast asian region almost 250 and if you take exchange transfusion as a surrogate for severe jaundice again the african continent contributing almost 200 uh, cases per 10000 live births in the southeast asian continent about uh, 100 cases per 10000 live births in a uh, modeling study which was done by uh, a group from uh, the us bhutani et al they in 2010 uh, said that almost 4 lakh to 5 lakh term near term newborn uh, newborn babies with severe neonatal jaundice are seen every year almost about a lakh deaths now this was based on very limited data that was uh, available it was more of a uh, modeling study but it underscores the uh, number of cases that we encountered both in terms of death as well as the survivors who were left with very severe neurological situation and as was rightly pointed out at the beginning almost one third of hospital readmission seemed to be happening in the first month of life because of jaundice now coming to the second part of sir's uh, question why are we seeing more and more cases of jaundice today well as a general uh, thumb rule in developing countries we possibly have more uh, exclusive breastfeeding more emphasis on exclusive breastfeeding more babies with uh, possibly intrauterine growth restriction a higher uh, prevalence of uh, genetic uh, polymorphisms contributing to jaundice also uh, many of these babies may uh, present late because of either delayed recognition by the mother the healthcare provider and the ability to measure serum bilirubin may be lacking today we more and more encourage delayed cord clamping this may also be contributing to some uh, degree of uh, higher jaundice that we encounter added to this are the usual risk factors which i'm sure my other panelists will uh, bring across one important factor we must all remember though phototherapy today is available the uh, variety of lights available and their quality their irradiance varies and hence the burden of neonatal jaundice is something that we must all be uh, very clear about and be very aware about uh, thank you dr sridhar for uh... this nice explanation i had just had one or two follow up questions on this uh, is there seasonal variation uh, with jaundice uh, and number one uh, and as a army person you are posted in different parts of india so do you see some difference in the instance of jaundice or severe jaundice in different parts of india in your personal experience 
So, uh, so coming to the first question about seasonal variation, yes, uh, it is a known fact that uh, given exclusive breastfeeding stress by all of us as pediatricians, there is a likely chance that uh, we may encounter uh, dehydration and uh, this may be contributing to some degree of seasonal variation that we do uh, see. Uh, the second part of the question, sir, the severe jaundice, one important contributor in India especially, is uh, G6PD deficiency, which is very prevalent in the north uh, of the country. And uh, this needs to be kept in mind when we encounter uh, very high jaundice, unconjugated, in the first few uh, days of life. Thank you. Thank you. So let's move on to the next question. Uh, Dr. Orvi, what according to you is the most common etiology uh, of jaundice? Maybe most common first four or five causes, top five causes. And do these causes differ in whether you're working in a district hospital or you're working at a she care center versus you're looking only at inborn babies versus you're getting referred babies? So are, are, are these the differences in etiology based on how you, where you're working? Um, most common, uh, if we see, 60 to 80 percent are mostly idiopathic. And uh, as per the NNPD data, the incidence of in-house live births, it is as low as 3.3 percent, while the extramural admissions with uh, this hyperbill uh, or complications, if we see, or morbidity, if we see, it's quite high up to 22 percent. Uh, reason may be because in in-house births, the babies are well screened. They are kept in close observations. The risk factors are well in mind. So we know that we need to be looked after these babies. Extramural, as already said, that they are referred late. The causes also need to be evaluated once they come to us and uh, morbidity also is high in this extramural. Most common causes, if we see, uh, there was very uh, early studies done in 1992, in 1997 at AIMS and PGI. Uh, it was seen, again, the idiopathic being the most common cause. It is the genetic polymorphisms, which I'll uh, tell. Uh, prematurity, ABO incompatibility, oxytocin, RH isoimmunization, sepsis, and G6PD deficiency, as already sir told. While in PGI, it was observed that after idiopathic, it is the G6PD deficiency, which comes common. Then is sepsis, and then is the ABO and RH incompatibility. Extra visited blood like cephal hematomas, uh, subgallial bleeds, and polycythemias. In fact, the recent study done in 2015 in Assam, uh, even by Keshwani et al., uh, even they have shown the, uh, the similar uh, etiological factors, very similar to what is done in AIMS. So the common causes still remain the same. Uh, so, uh, as we see the birth weight, just it is a prematurity, uh, prolonged rupture of membranes. So, early onset sepsis also leads to jaundice uh, quite in these babies. Uh, genetic polymorphisms, if we see uh, the two types of uh, gene variability which is seen, uh, that is uh, one in the uh, SLCO. B1, B3 gene. There are two types of polymorphisms which occur and that causes the idiopathic jaundice, which is more common. Associated again with race, uh, inherited and other acquired defects, which we uh, know uh, very much is talked by Dr. Sridhar, many other causes uh, which are associated with this. So uh, I think uh, the causes for inborn and outborn uh, almost are same, but only thing the incidence is much lower in the in-house. Thank you, Dr. Ruby. I, I think uh, one cause uh, which many studies have uh, not looked upon more deeply is uh, related to inadequate breastfeeding. Um, many a times, uh, as you said, rightly said, inborn babies have less chances of jaundice as compared to outborn babies. Because in outborn babies, maybe maybe the morbidities are less. That's yes. what we can but say. But I think inborn babies. The incidence of jaundice also depends upon what kind of support for breastfeeding is given. Yes. If breastfeeding support is less, then babies are more likely to have uh, uh, breastfeeding jaundice. And many a time, this is classified as idiopathic because there, there is no investigation to be confirmed. But many a times, if you do serial weight monitoring, one can do sodium levels, urea levels, then one can suspect that the baby has high sodium levels and uh, more than biological weight loss, then uh, inadequate feeding can be one very important cause. Thank you, Dr. Ovi. Uh, so let's move on to the next question, Dr. Muhammad. Uh, is it possible to tell which baby have jaundice? 
uh, may have done this before to discharge because as you see that uh, uh, we discharge babies any time between 24 to 72 hours. Babies with jaundice, normal delivery are discharged maybe at 24 hours to 48 hours. With section, they are discharged after three days, four days, or five days. While peak of the jaundice occurs uh, at the end of the first week of life. So it, it is very important to look at risk factors and to try to predict that which babies are more likely to develop jaundice. So uh, can we have some idea about in, in which baby risk factors? As we have seen in the previous discussions that Dr. Urvi mentioned that uh, the most common cause of jaundice is idiopathic. Still, we have risk factors where we have to be aggressive to screen and to diagnose for the jaundice as well as the treatment. The common risk factors are included related to the maternal and the baby's blood group uh, incompatibility related like isoimmune hemolytic diseases, whether it is RH incompatibility or it is ABO in setup. Then the G6 pedi uh, deficiency, which is more common in the SR said in the first slide in the North Indians, like in Parsi, Sindhis, and in Gujarat, particularly in the Prajapati communities, the congenital hypothyroidism, uh, where usually mother maternal hypothyroidism is also considered as a risk factor. The sepsis, asphyxia, acidosis, kefali hematoma, infant of diabetic mother, and of course polycythemia, all these are risk factors. Apart from being a risk factor for the jaundice, in these babies who are having metabolic acidosis, sepsis, asphyxia, uh, their uh, brain, uh, I mean, uh, the risk of developing bilirubin-induced uh, neuronal damage is also very high because of all this risk factor. The blood-brain barrier is affected. So all these babies should have a high index of suspicion, should be screened properly and supervised properly before discharge. And uh, that we will learn in the next subsequent slide that how is to be follow up and how, how to assess this on uh, at the time of discharge. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So just a question. You said that this is three deficiency instance is quite high in Gujarat, especially in sub communities. So is there practice of routinely screening neonates for this three deficiency? Yes, sir. Uh, yes. yes, we are offering the newborn screening, the basic one, which co covers at least congenital hypothyro uh, hypothyroidism, G6PD, and uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia. This is the basic newborn screening that we advise the parents because uh, of high incidence of these disorders. And yes, we do at our institution, we are doing routinely for all the babies who are delivered. So, do you get the report of this G6PD deficiency, whether yes. it's or not before discharge? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And yes. If we usually we we usually don't get it uh, printed copy, but at least email we get it within twenty four to forty eight hours. Same same with us also. So if baby is having deficiency in screening, so is the delay, discharge delayed or you call them? We counsel, we counsel the relative about the same, and it's a screening test. Then we go for the confirmatory test and we explain the relative accordingly. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Muhammad. So moving on to Dr. Sridhar back, uh, can the uh, so let's say baby comes to clinic, baby comes to follow-up clinic uh, or in the ward uh, or you detect during your ward rounds that baby has uh, jaundice clinically, like we teach our undergraduate and postgraduate students how to look at jaundice. So can clinically we look at baby and see how much baby jaundice baby has or, or the clinical assessment has any limitations? Uh, so, from time immemorial, we as clinicians have relied on uh, the uh, dermal zones as first proposed by Kramer et al. in the year 1969. Uh, this follows a cephalocaudal progression and uh, we recognize these zones very uh, distinctly. A word of caution, uh, we must remember that these uh, descriptions or rather the visual interpretation of jaundice is uh, noted to be unreliable even uh, among pediatricians, among the healthcare providers. And uh, between two people, there can be a large uh, you know, difference in opinion about what is uh, the normal level of interest. Having said that, this remains the most non-invasive and the you know, clinically easily available tool that at least should prompt us in the appropriate clinical setting, given the uh, gestational age, given the weight, given the set of risk factors, to go further to uh, either do a transcutaneous bilirubin uh, estimation in a more than 35 week baby if we have one, or order for a total bilirubin value uh, if our uh, lab facilities permit. So uh, the visual estimation remains today the easily available tool that we must uh, use. But remember that the tinge of interest, a dark skinned baby 
the uh, you know the clinical recognition may be difficult and uh, matching the pro watching the progression may be difficult. Similarly, a baby that you started phototherapy on, you can't use the clinical method uh, anymore. And if the levels of bilirubin are rapidly rising, like, as in an isoimmune polytic disease or a disease period deficiency, using this visual estimation may not be reliable. And it is highly subjective, as I've said. So if you keep these limitations in mind, you can use this tool, but then supplement it with either a TCB or a TSP as, as a clinical situation for cancer. Thank you, Dr. Sridhar. I think the, these three limitations are very important. Uh, and I think there are two, two questions here. First is to clinically look at baby and see whether jaundice is there or not. And second, to look and try to estimate the level of the load. Now, if you go to the try to estimate the level, that is, that is I think, very dangerous territory. As you have rightly shown in this slide, there's a lot of overlap between the zones. So, and then if it is rapidly rising, as you said, or skin is dark, you not you may not be able to estimate the level of jaundice. But uh, 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 it may have some value in looking at whether jaundice is present or not. And if you look at uh, the WHO guidebook of the arrangement, it used to say that, and if face is having uh, any jaundice on first day. Jaundice on legs and arms on second day, and jaundice on palms and soles on any day. Uh, it, it, it indicates that you need to do serum building. So, for community health workers, for uh, people, nurses who are looking in community or uh, you are looking in, in your wards, I think these are very good uh, broad indicators. But as you rightly pointed out, if you are looking at jaundice and it, it looks to be present, then it is better to go for a more objective method. Thank you. Uh, moving on to Dr. Uh, Urvi, as Dr. Gopal said that uh, TCB can be used. So uh, what is your experience of using TCB? What does literature say? Uh, and uh, uh, is, is it a costly affair? What kind of hospital, how large a hospital should be to afford it? And does this truly add value to the quality of care of newborn babies? Yes, sir. Uh, I'm using since years. So now I'm quite uh, dependent on the transcutaneous machine. Uh, it is a very uh, handy and easy to use uh, non-invasive device. Ranging, I mean, cost is quite high. It goes from 1.5 to 3.5 lakh, depending on the companies. That is the latest, the Dragger and the Billicare. They all cost almost similar from 3 to 3.5 lakhs. But it is a, like a point of care for an outpatient as well as the indoor patients, very reliable on more than 35 weeks or 35 weeks baby. So near term, term babies, it's quite a useful device. Uh, since jaundice is a very common condition and benign in majority, but still we need to be closely watching all these babies. So it's quite a uh, reliable non-invasive method. And since it measures the yellowness of the skin by analyzing the spectrum of light, the previous older machines, they used to measure very few wavelengths. So there could be a lot of other factors which used to affect the value of the transcutaneous. But the newer machines, they in fact have more than 100 different wavelengths. So all the factors like the dermal thickness, the color of the skin, and all those things gets negated. So the newer machines are quite reliable. Second, uh, the bilirubin index used to come and we had to calculate. But now we get directly milligram per DL values. So again, that is uh, easy to analyze. Second thing, uh, uh, even many articles and many studies have been done in which the nomograms have been developed for a 35 weeker or above. So it is easy to predict from that that which babies will need a uh, further evaluation. Definitely serum bilirubin is a gold standard, but transcutaneous acts as a screening tool for where there can be a large number of babies, even in private setups where if we get all those VIP patients, if we say, who don't want to get their babies pricked, then transcutaneous acts is quite a, a good uh, device to help all those things. Yes, again, second disadvantage after phototherapy, it becomes a bit, little bit less, uh, less reliable to use it. One or two studies have been done in uh, 28, 24 weeks, the latest machines of JM105. And uh, they are trying to show how it can be more and nomograms need to be developed for all these premature babies. But obviously, serum bilirubin has to be done. Uh, the cutoff values in one or two articles have shown that if we get a TCB value of 13, we should screen these babies. Or if the TCB value falls more than 50th percentile of the nomograms, 
we should always go for a serum bilirubin and screen these babies uh, further for the cause and even for the decision making. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ovi. So if I, if I can summarize, you said it is an accurate, especially if levels are less than 13 to 14 mg per deciliter. Number two, it can be used as a uh, prediction tool that you measure it and then plot it on a nomogram. Third, it can also be used to and as a part of examination, when you are trying to assess the reality of John Nissen and you want baby during opening results or during the board rounds. Thank you. Thank you. So let's say that I would, I would like to add that uh, two very important practical aspects about transcutaneous bilirubin inhibitor. It avoids unnecessary prick. And the second that you can advise the discharge based on the level. If you are discharging and you are doing transcutaneous bilirubin inhibitor, so you can advise them whether they need to come in within for 24 hours or 48 hours or 72 hours, like based on the normal grind that majority of the machines are providing to uh, these days. Yeah, rightly pointed out. Uh, studies have shown from India that it can reduce need of sampling by almost 40%. Yes. One more thing, sir. Billy Care, uh, like they measure it on the ear lobule. So that not many research or articles have been published for that machines, but the uh, other which is done on the forehead and the sternum, it's quite reliable. You have to just clean with alcohol swab and it's easily used. So, so it's a good investment. Yes. Yes. So, so Dr. Muhammad, once there is a jaundice which is significant and needs treatment, uh, what is the minimum lab work you need apart from serum bilirubin? Uh, what was minimum lab work you need and can you start for therapy just on clinical grounds without uh, looking at serum bilirubin or uh, while you are waiting for the report? In majority of the cases, as we all know that the uh, physiological jaundice of neonatology usually starts at second day or third day and reaches to the peak by five to six days and then it goes away within first two weeks of the life. So majority of them are exaggerated physiological jaundice in majority of the cases. But the minimum workup that is needed uh, is to know the mother's blood group, to identify the baby's blood group so that we can, as we have seen in the cause, we can um, categorize the risk or the cause. Of course, serum bilirubin, but it is not only total bilirubin. We need to know the conjugated and unconjugated fractions uh, uh, because treatments are different. Peripheral smears and reticulocyte count and DCT if you are having uh, isoimmunomolytic disorder, like mother's blood group is O positive, and if baby's blood group is B positive, or mother's blood group is RH negative and baby's blood group is positive, and a hematocrit value because uh, polycythema is again a risk factor for jaundice and uh, low hemoglobin you can um, examine for the occult hemorrhages in the body, like in kephalomatoma. G6PD, of course. And after these basic investigations, further investigations are to be based on the history, examination finding, and the primary investigations report. So uh, investigations in a very high risk uh, situations, like if there is a history of previous baby who, who had severe jaundice, who need required exchange transfusion, or there's, there was conjunctitis in a previous sibling, onset of jaundice within first 24 hours is of course pathological or after 72 hours of age, yellow palm and sole, you cannot wait, and persistent jaundice beyond three weeks needs a full workup. Jaundice infants with yellow colored urine or clay colored stool, these are the danger signs that you need to be aggressive for uh, these babies. And yes, phototherapy can not be started on clinical grounds. You have to have serum bilirubin values because we follow uh, specific charts uh, to decide whether the child needs phototherapy or not. That we'll see in subsequent slides. Yeah. Well, so so uh, many hospitals use the bedside micro bilirubinometer to look at serum bilirubin. So in that case, report will come maybe in 10 minutes and you can wait till serum bilirubin values there before you start for therapy. But in many hospitals, the sample is sent to a lab, lab and report will come maybe in two hours, three hours. So in babies who have signs of connectors or you have palm and soul strain and your TCB value is showing very high. So it may be an option to start for therapy immediately. And then while you are waiting for are expected to have a delay, you know, so yes. there of course. So we'll come to, uh, uh, at what level to treat and what are the various properties of phototherapy. But before we go there, uh, many times we see that many hospitals start treating uh, even physiological jaundice. So uh, is, is there a harm in any over aggressive treatment of uh, jaundice or any advantage of treating even mild jaundice, Dr. Sridhar? 
so as we all know, bilirubin is a naturally occurring uh, antioxidant. And uh, today with the availability of uh, very highly effective uh, phototherapy, most of us tend to use it uh, on clinical grounds as was brought out uh, by the panelists. Uh, in a very large study that was done in uh, 2008, uh, there was a uh, you know, surprisingly uh, increased incidence of mortality among the smallest and the sickest babies. But these were babies actually between 500 to 750 grams. A lot of questions were raised on whether this mortality was attributable to the use of phototherapy or was just a reflection of the level of sickness. But this was an RCT and it uh, made people sit up and take notice that in the very low birth weight or the extremely low birth weight population, is it right to treat aggressively? And uh, today, there are questions being uh, raised on whether the use of such aggressive phototherapy is uh, good or not. Now, coming to the general side effects of phototherapy that we all know, it disrupts the maternal infant bonding. Many uh, mothers in that uh, phase of uh, lactational you know, uh, uncertainty, wanting to initiate feeds, uh, have a little bit of a disruption in their uh, letdown, their ability to bond with the baby. And there are other risks that we are all very well aware of, risks of temperature instability, both hypothermia and hypothermia. The earlier uh, tube lights, the CFLs, had the risk of hypothermia, especially in uh, warm uh, environments. Mm -hmm. Today, the LED lights do not have any uh, heat generation uh, with them, and they may expose the baby to the risk of hypothermia. So attention to temperature is very important. As we said, interruption of breastfeeding. And so the mother may need a lot of counseling, a lot of help and support to continue uh, breastfeeding. There can be risk of dehydration because of increased uh, insensible water loss. And we need to account for this when we uh, help the mother breastfeed. There can be increased incidence of loose tools. There are also reports of increased skin rash. And the reason why we cover the eyes, the reported risk of retirement toxicity, in a baby that has cholestasis, if we accidentally end up giving phototherapy, we may have the bronze baby syndrome. So, uh, to sum it, we must use it based on standard guidelines and standard uh, you know, protocols and not give it to even babies that look like having just mild uh, numbers. Thank you. Thank you. And one very related question. Sometimes uh, what happens that uh, uh, babies coming, families coming to bring baby and saying that this baby has jaundice. You see the baby and uh, uh, you say that uh, jaundice is very mild. We will again look at uh, on the baby after two days. Meanwhile, you can put baby under sunlight. So, uh, Dr. Orvi, is it a good practice to put babies under sunlight if baby has jaundice? Is it effective or, or, or can there be harms of uh, sunlight on baby? Actually, it's a very age-old tradition by the grandmothers and uh, I don't know about pediatricians, but yes, uh, grandmothers have uh, always been assuring the pediatricians that we will manage the jaundice by the sunlight. So very, I think since years we are seeing that. Sunlight is effective because it has a similar spectrum like phototherapy, but only disadvantage, it also emits other harmful lights, that is the UV and the infrared radiations, which can cause the sunburn and the skin cancer. So exposing to baby to sunlight is the uh, risk of the radiation. Secondly, it also causes a lot of temperature variations, dehydration, and um, uh, depending on the climate, like if it's a summer season, baby may go into severe dehydration. If it's winter, they become cold. One very good uh, study was done in Nigeria. That is a Stanford trial, which was done. And they had used the sunlight as an adjuvant therapy to conventional phototherapy. They had made canopies and the babies were kept in the cradle and they were given phototherapy. Uh, so it is maybe useful in a very low or low middle income countries where this phototherapy machines are not very much available or they are shortage and there is a lot of babies who may be having jaundice. Uh, and so it can be used in rotations with the phototherapy and the uh, sunlight. Other thing is that uh, uh, these were made with a special polycarbonate films and they were having the they were cutting off the sunlight uh, which were having the harmful radiation so only the good light was used for treating the babies biggest advantage that there is a bonding of the mother and uh, the baby which i think dr uh, shridhar sir told that that is not hampered the feeding and everything gets continued and also if there is a heavy workload then sunlight can act as a adjuvant to phototherapy but only thing, if this is uh, applied in the, say, what we want in, in the low or middle income countries, 
then the logistics is in a question because if they are not made in a proper polycarbonate roof and walls which are lined with the imported films then it can have a, a disastrous effect on the baby and again thus if the substandard filters are used then again safety issues are there so sunlight like uh, if we see the recent trend of using solar panels for conserving the electricity and everything if research is done that whether we can use the sunlight to create certain things and at home if it can be used i think that is still beyond the scope of our uh, treatment or uh, care of the baby so sunlight still we cannot advise to the relatives uh, except for vitamin d otherwise phototherapy is the treatment of choice for uh, present uh, jaundice thing yeah. so if jaundice is mild then there is no need of treatment if jaundice needs yeah. treatment then sunlight is not only it's harmful but it will not cause a therapeutic decline in hemoglobin so if baby needs actual for therapy yes because there are certain criteria we have to expose the babies in that sunlight the body should be exposed how we do it in the phototherapy so i don't think we'll be able to do it practically uh, in the actual sunlight which comes on the different parts of the country which will be high or low so which cannot advise it practically right now thank you thank you so uh, dr mohammad uh, this breast milk jaundice or breast feeding jaundice uh, what is this entity it is suspected in many babies there is nothing to diagnose there is no investigation to diagnose it so how you suspect it diagnose it and how to manage these cases dr mohammad okay am i audible now Okay. Yes, yes. Yeah. So as you as you said, sir, that uh, it cannot be diagnosed by any test. So it is always a diagnosis of exclusion. But the natural or the common trend of this breast milk jaundice is that it typically begins first in first three to five days of life. It reaches to the peak by second week of age. So majority of the babies who are uh, presenting in the second week of life with the jaundice with a very high level, usually they are suspected of having breast milk jaundice, and those who are on exclusive breast milk. it usually returns to the normal over next 3 to 12 weeks but the affected infants have a very good weight gain uh, they they are not sick babies they don't have any evidence of hemolysis and having a normal liver function test of course they needs investigation as i said it is it is a diagnosis of exclusion and the mechanism is uh, human milk contains certain factors uh, possibility uh, beta glucuronidase that deconjugates intestinal bilirubin that goes into enterohepatic circulation and affect, uh, promotes its absorption uh, but the good thing is that it resolves spontaneously and rarely it requires phototherapy uh, major previously we were been thought that uh, stopping breast milk for 2 days and it will come down to a significantly lower level and again starting of breast feeding uh, the uh, shoot up in the bilirubin will not be uh, that high after that but uh, current recommendation is there is no need to stop breast milk and breast feeding is not at all stopped and it is being continued and if they require uh, they are given phototherapy yeah i think this is a very important message which you are giving Uh, and i will try to combine with what dr shridhar said <clears throat> the first thing is that uh, uh bilirubin probably is it is an antioxidant and that is why nature has made it in such a way that if baby is breastfeeding this baby will continue to have uh, uh, a certain level of bilirubin which is not harmful which is not which does not need treatment and as you have pointed out this baby will have normal weight gain they will be healthy they will be taking breastfeeding and but very important that this needs to be differentiated from jaundice which occurs because of inadequacy of feeding these baby will be fussy these baby will be not be gaining weight they are not put will be less and these baby need, do not need stopping breast feeding they need counseling and help mothers to give supervised breast feeding adequate feeding so that they start gaining weight so if once you have ruled out that it is not related to inadequate feeding and baby continues to have some level of jaundice then it is a good idea to do investigation for uh, thyroid function test if not done in screening or lft after 3 weeks and if it is nothing is there then these baby who are actually best feed will the jaundice will naturally come down in 3 4 5 or 6 weeks thank you dr mohammad now coming to uh, uh, treatment of jaundice uh, dr shridha uh, once you decide that baby needs treatment which charts we should refer to there are many charts now especially for preterm babies so Which chart to use for term baby? Which chart to use for preterm babies? This uh, has 
uh, been uh, a very standard uh, chart that we've used for quite a while now. And this has come out uh, way back in the year 2004, published by the American Academy of Pediatrics. One must remember that these charts are uh, at the moment based on uh, you know best practice guidelines. They're not evidence-based, but they are very, very useful uh, as the basic treatment uh, of jaundice. We can follow these charts in the hospitalized newborns. Uh, so coming to the first chart, which is the AAP chart, this identifies the total bilirubin value of the y-axis in milligrams per deciliter and the postnatal uh, age of the baby in hours. It has three lines. The lowermost line is the infant who is a high-risk infant. This is an infant between 35 to 37, 6 by 7 with the, with the uh, risk factors. The middle line is the uh, set of babies that are of medium risk. Either the 35, 37, 6 by 7 weeks who do not have risk factors or the 38 weeks and beyond babies with risk factors. And the topmost line is the low risk babies who are 38 weeks and well. Now, these risk factors typically include isoimmune hemolytic disease, that is the RH, the ABO, the maybe minor blood group compatibility. Any sick baby, any baby that has sepsis, acidosis, uh, temperature instability, maybe asphyxia, uh, and if measured, a zero bilirubin value that's below 3 grams per deciliter. Now, uh, we also have the National Institute of uh, Clinical Excellence and uh, the NICE guidelines, as they call it in the UK. These guidelines uh, require some basic information about is there a DCT positivity? What is the baby's blood group? What is the mother's blood group? And these uh, require you to just plug in the gestation of the baby, and they will give you at post into hours of life or days from birth. What is the value at which you must consider phototherapy? What is the value at which you must consider exchange therapy? Typically, most hospitals would use the AAP charts to uh, take decisions at phototherapy on a uh, routine basis. And uh, in a given scenario, if one wants to recheck or reconfirm, we could fall back to the NICE guidelines. For the preterm babies, for a long time, we were using only uh, a thumb rule. And uh, this chart, which is the Mason's chart, which came back uh, way in 2012. As you can see, below 28 weeks, phototherapy is begun at values of bilirubin that are around 5 to 6 milligrams per deciliter. And as gestation proceeds, uh, these values are also uh, progressively increased. Then we double this value of this uh, value per exchange. Recently, there was uh, a similar chart that was, or a similar graph that was plotted by uh, Finlay et al., uh, published in the new reviews which also tried to plot this against the postnatal age in uh, ours. Uh, you must remember the way we practice in uh, neonatal intensive care, most of us uh, intuitively would begin phototherapy if we see a preterm baby uh, wearing a trick. We may use uh, phototherapy for a while, maybe a day or two, and as the baby appears bleached, we would uh, discontinue. In a sicker baby, it is advisable to probably follow one of these uh, charts to actually know what the level of bilirubin was. Because uh, this bilirubin could be one of the factors contributing to neurological injury or white matter injury. Thank you, Dr. Sridhar. Uh, so, it is important to classify babies, whether they belong to low, medium, or high risk, to look at what is the gestation and then use one of these charts for term and preterm babies. Be consistent in your unit so that there is no confusion that what you are using and then follow them as a uniform guideline. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Urvi, uh, one very important thing which we see, especially uh, as the summer is starting, that babies come with jaundice. Uh, some of them have weight loss, some of them do not have weight loss. Uh, but when jaundice is high, nearing exchange, uh, many people try to give IV fluid bolus and then see whether jaundice comes down just with IV fluid and we can escape doing exchange on season. So is it advisable to give this fluid bolus or fluid challenge in babies with jaundice? Well, uh, it's, uh, if we see baby is feeding well and the values are not near exchange levels. So as per the two guidelines, that is a nice guidelines, it recommends that if the babies are breastfeeding well, they should not be routinely supplemented with any formula or IV fluids for the treatment of jaundice. As per our own NNF clinical practice guidelines published in 2020, it again recommends the need for additional fluids in photography only on individual clinical basis. So if it is like near exchange level and we are waiting for exchange, yes, definitely we should give some fluids along with the feeding. And uh, But routine supplementation, if the baby is feeding well, uh, there is no any recommendation. 
uh, if we see the weight, if there is severe dehydration, if the sodium levels are high, and baby is having signs of hypernatremia or all those things, create level like a pre-renal failure, urine output is less, then this could be individualized and we can plan for giving fluids or bonus to these babies. But breastfeeding should be continued. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I think this we have dealt with that breastfeeding should be continued. So I will skip this question and move on to the next question. Uh, Dr. Shridhar, back to you, I think. So uh, there are many machines available now, CFL, LED, Billy Blanket, and people have not tried to move on to LED phototherapy. So is it correct to move on to LED phototherapy? Are these more effective or they are just less costly but to maintain, to be used in level two or level three units? Which, which of these two prefer? Uh, so over the last few years, we uh, have increasingly seen uh, more uh, use of these LED phototherapy units. And we've come to recognize that these are highly effective. Almost all the LED phototherapy uh, units that are available in the market, uh, one, have a long shelf life. Second, deliver a uniform uh, spectral irradiance that is more than at least 30 microwatt per centimeter square per nanometer. And they're very easy to maintain. Unlike the old, uh, maybe the tube light, the CFLs, which required regular replacement, uh, checking the spectral irradiance, most of these units, uh, if used appropriately, uh, either the reflecting one or the double uh, surface ones have a bassinet and the baby is exposed to the maximal surface area of highly effective uh, intensive phototherapy. So even level to uh, smaller units could invest in these double surface LED phototherapy units because they give you what you need the most good assured spectral irradiance and also the ease of uh, use. With a very long shelf life for these machines, they don't require replacement uh, for as long as three to five years. Yeah, so I agree. But one one caveat which I want to place is that they are so easily easy to manufacture that anyone can import LED lights from China and start selling them. So now there are maybe hundreds of manufacturers, especially if you go through the government's gem portal. Uh, there are a plethora of people who uh, who manufacture and uh, market them. So it is if you're buying LED for therapy, it is important to look at their certificate that at what wavelength the light is being given. That, that is very important that the blue light which you are using is of good quality. But but as Dr. Shida said, uh, it, it is a good investment and over because they last so long and they are so effective, it is good to invest in LED for machines. So Dr. Orvi, once you start for therapy, how should we monitor billable levels and at what level we should stop for therapy? Uh, once we start phototherapy, uh, the following consensus is usually followed and has also been uh, guidelines have been put on for this, that the bilirubin value, if it is near exchange transfusion, then the total serum, serum bilirubin, it should be measured every four to six hourly after initiation of the intensive phototherapy. Once the serum bilirubin starts declining, there is, and you're sure you don't want to go for exchange transfusion, then we can go for measurement every eight to 12 hours. A uh, follow-up measurement of serum bilirubin, uh, like once the bilirubin level, it comes below 2.9 milligram per uh, deciliter of the phototherapy level as per the charts, then we need to stop the phototherapy. After stopping, we should measure after it's around 12 to 24 hours or say at 18 hours uh, in babies who are uh, been given phototherapy. So rebound serum bilirubin has a very good importance and also to plan for whether they need again a follow-up checkup or uh, they need to be still monitored for a longer time with a very high risk factors if they are there, then these help us to predict that. So I think very important message that once you start for therapy, depending upon the starting level, you should repeat bilirubin anytime from 4 to 24 hours. It varies depending upon what kind of bilirubin is starting. And if it is near exchange range, one should repeat it uh, four to six hours. Good. Uh, Dr. Muhammad, uh, uh, how long will the therapy machine remain effective? I think we'll need to answer from both CFL and LED because some people still use CFL for therapy. And uh, how does one know that whether you need to change CFL or LED light source? As we have seen in the previous slide that has uh, shown the newer LED uh, phototherapies, majority of them are coming with the hours of usage. So we need to change the lights after the thousand hours of use. And periodically, ideally, we all should be checking the flux 
the minimum uh, spectral irradiance of the flux, which is usually checked by the fluxometer, you can outsource any agency who are coming with a fluxometer and check, which has to be checked at the level of infant skin. And it should be at least 15 uh, microwatt per centimeter square per nanometer. And for intensive phototherapy, it has to be 30 microwatt per centimeter square per nanometer. But 15 is the minimum that you need to have. If your flux uh, value is less than 15 microwatt, then you should, uh, and it is a time to change the lights. And as I've uh, said that the newer machines are having the hours of usage. So after 1000 hours, you need to change the phototherapy lights. Uh, or usually after three months, or if you see the blackening at the end of the tube lights or the tube lights are flickering, then that is the time to change the uh, lights. And by any means, substandard, substandard lights also never be used for photography. Thank you. Thank you. So it is important to monitor the effectiveness of your phototherapy and change the light source as indicated by a manufacturer or as indicated by a fall in the flux. So Dr. Sridhar, can we use any drugs to to enhance the effectiveness of phototherapy. Phototherapy is the standard treatment, but can we add something to, uh, to treatment of jaundice? Uh, so there are many drugs that have been used uh, in specific situations. The one that is still uh, used across many units remains uh, the intravenous immunoglobulin. Uh, the dose that we use commonly is 0.5 to 1 gram per kilogram, and it's specifically used in isoimmune metabolic disease. Now, the recommendation for use is when the total bilirubin is rising despite intensive effective phototherapy or it is within 2-3 milligrams of the threshold for exchange as you're waiting for the blood to arrive. Now, IVIG still remains a very, very controversial use uh, among many units today after the uh, systematic review 2014 showed that studies that had a low risk of bias actually indicated no benefit and there have been a lot of concerns with the product uh, safety. There were uh, reports of anaphylactic reactions of uh, even deaths reported to the use of IVIG. And off late, people have gone away from the use of uh, IVIG in many units and have started effective intensive phototherapy and may consider IVIG only in those situations where you don't have ready access to exchange transfusion and you want to supplement the uh, use of phototherapy. The other drugs which we uh, use sometimes are the ursodeoxycholic acid, which typically is used in unity cholestasis to increase uh, the excretion. Now, all the other medications like phenobarbiton, the thin mesopropyrins, and the clofibrate, uh, though, and laxatives, uh, some we would even have been used in such goals, though theoretically they have a sound basis in their mechanism of action, have not been uh, used routinely and they are not the standard of care. Phenobarbitone is used only during priming for the HIDA scan for evaluation of a baby with genetic cholestasis. It does not add anything to effective phototherapy in the majority of situations. It's not used routinely. Similarly, thin mesomorphine, though the uh, inhibition of hemoxygenase is a very attractive theoretical model, it, uh, I, 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 to the best of my knowledge, it is not available and it is not being used in uh, any uh, you know, same goes for clofibrate and efficacy and safety have also been issues with some of these uh, patients. So in uh, summary, it is just IVIG and UDCA in the case of uh, unit cholestasis. Thank you. Thank you. So Dr. Orvi, are there any side effects for therapy? Yes, sir. Uh, already Dr. Sridhar had covered earlier in short uh, previously. Yeah. So I just like to again uh, uh, reconfirm the short term side effects like dehydration, diarrhea, hyperthermia, hypothermia, skin rash, abdominal distension, disturbance of the circadian rhythm with jitteriness. These are very short term effects. Uh, other laboratory detected short term side effects like there is a decline in calcium level rising in the retic count, ri uh, sorry, decreasing in the platelet count rising in the total count. But all these effects are very short-lived and they soon disappear soon after stoppage of phototherapy. A very nice uh, review article published in ECTA Pediatrics in 2015, they very well summarized all these side effects of uh, phototherapy. Uh, and as we already discussed earlier, the bilirubin is an antioxidant. So if we give phototherapy, this antioxidant process is a bit hampered. So all these oxidative stress also has the side effects. Long-term side effects like the melanocytic navy, the allergic diseases, it has been uh, seen that uh, the autoimmune system is affected and that's why they cause long-term some allergic disease in the babies who have undergone phototherapy. Uh, 
retinal damage that is the if the eyes are not well padded or were not well covered then again they may cause retinal damaged rop even opening of duct is seen in very preterm and very elbw babies who are under phototherapy the reason uh, as per this article they say that because of the oxidative stress on the aorta and they may cause the decrease in the uh, vascular resistance and may keep the duct open but all these need still reconfirmation with the proper research articles but these are long term effects which have been observed so so essentially if you give carefully and as indicated for therapy has a reversible mild side effects yes no over treatment right. yes okay so uh, uh, one very important uh, uh, consequence of jaundice which is untreated is bilirubin encephalopathy so dr mohammed how to monitor clinically for presence of uh, acute bilirubin encephalopathy okay uh, as i said sir many of the babies are coming with the bilirubin level of more than 20 24 29 <laughs> so whether the damage has already occurred or uh, how much is the uh, scope that we need to understand so for that we uh, we are using bind scoring that is uh, uh, the scoring is uh, then based on assessment of the neurological status of the baby and they are scored from 1 2 and 3 for the this three aspect that is mental status muscle tone and cry the mental st status whether the baby is sleepy and having poor feeding or lethargy or irritability or baby is in stuprous and coma and having seizures and muscle tone whether there is slight decrease hyper or hypotonia depending upon the arousal state and knuckle and trunkal arcing and markedly increase like opisthotonus posturing or decrease tone or bicycling movements and cry whether high pitch cry shrill cry or inconsolable cry so based on that we assess the bind scoring that and uh, the total score if it is between 4 to 6 then it is still in reversible acute bilirubin uh, encephalopathy if it is more than 6 it is uh, indicative of irreversible damage So, so if baby presents with high bilirubin levels, it is important to examine babies for these signs, especially in these three domains: mental score, tone, and cry. And then try to follow till the levels come to below non neurotoxic level. So one should actively look for these signs and symptoms in babies who have high bilirubin levels. Thank you. So, Dr. Shida, you showed us charts, both AAP chart and NICE chart, which showed that on x-axis the age at which Exchange transfusion is indicated, and and on y axis the level of bilirubin at which you will do exchange. Are there other indications of exchange apart from looking at these AP or NICE charts? Uh, so we have charts for exchange transfusion which have been published by the AP in the very same document in two thousand and four. But what is universally followed is in a given setting, if one has suspicion of isolimum hemolysis, the uh, Cod samples are collected, and if you have a cod bilirubin that is more than five milligrams per deciliter, a hemoglobin that is less than ten grams per deciliter, or a rate of rise of bilirubin, some would say point five, some use one milligrams per deciliter per hour. But more important than all of this is any baby who may be readmitted or during the process of uh, clinical stage shows any sign of acute bilirubin encephalopathy, as brought out by Dr. Norman. The use of this point score, giving you a score of more than or equal to four. Is actually an indication for going into an exchange transfusion. Now, most of us work in units that may not have access to exchange transfusion easily, and it may not be a procedure that uh, is now today common. Uh, so, many fellows, many residents, many faculty may not have seen it for a while, and there are worries about safety, about availability of safe blood, and the whole procedure. So, the rule of, rule of thumb says. These are the absolute indications. Any baby with an acute bilirubin encephalopathy, one must strongly consider an exchange transfusion. And as you are awaiting blood for the exchange, uh, you must continue with the effective uh, intensive phototherapy. Okay, good. So, if we decide to go ahead with exchange transfusion, Dr. Orvi, what what do we use? Yes. Uh... if we go for a planning for an exchange the common thing which we have to see for all the blood blood is that the hematocrit of the blood should be at least 0.5 to 0.6 that is uh, 50 to 60% it should be as fresh as possible that is less than a 5 days old whole blood appropriate group based that i'll uh, tell in detail it should be a leukocyte depleted blood irradiated and used within 24 hours of the irradiation and a cmv negative blood now if you see the blood group wise so if it is the rh incompatibility is the cause for the um, hyperbil then the rbc as i said less than 5 days old it should be rh negative rbcs and 
why we choose this because they have a do not have the major blood group antigens and so they will be not hemolyzed by the maternal antibodies secondly these rbcs if they uh, should be suspended in the ap plasma so available the lab or the blood banks they easily prepare this because you already advise them if we are doing keeping it ready before delivery they should be cross matched against the mother's blood and if we are doing it after delivery they must be cross matched with the mother as well as the baby now if it is a abo incompatibility then in abo incompatibility uh, the blue, blood group should be o i mean the blood should be o and rh specific that is if the baby is negative or, or um, positive the rh specific rbc should be suspended in the ab plasma these rbcs will contain low level of antibodies and lack the antigen that could trigger any circulating maternal antibodies in the newborn subsequent transfusions also should be done after compatibility with the mother's and infant's blood both is done if there is minor blood group incompatibilities if we are suspecting it just needs to be cross matched to the infant's plasma and the blood type thank you uh, i think uh, two points which i wanted to clarify was should we use aggregated blood for all tissue transfusions or liquid should be treated for all transfusions or there are specific situations in which these should be used so nowadays actually it's done for the all uh, all types of blood that is leuco depleted to avoid any uh, transfusion reactions and yeah. uh, irradiated blood also so itself cmv is uh, negated and other reactions happening because of that so irradiation is also necessary I and it is yeah. done even in our city like rajkot even the blood banks are doing it so don't think it should be a issue should yeah. make it a rule and they are ready to help we should do it so so uh, because i asked because at many places it may not be available so maybe should not be just referred that we do not have related to blood or cmv negative blood is not tested because these are issues more in babies who have received intrauterine transfusion or babies who are very preterm in which there is of graft versus whole disease is there so so uh, if you if you are working in a district hospital in pepi hospital there you can do exchange but there is no radiation available i don't think we should uh, Uh, stop from doing it. No, it should not stop it, but it's a good thing if it's done. Yes. So, uh, Dr. Muhammad, I think this is the last question of the panel. Um, it is very common, and I think we have dealt it previously also with the the best feeding jaundice babies who come at three to four weeks of jaundice, persisting jaundice. How do you approach such cases? for these babies who are presenting late i mean in third and fourth week one the uh, first thing that you need to categorize them whether it is persistent unconjugated hypobilirubinemia or it is a neonatal cholestasis that is conjugated bilirubinemia because the second one is the most common at this age uh, so both of them have a different approach and dis- different treatment so that is why uh, this categorization is very important and yes of course we have discussed breast milk jaundice is the commonest other common causes are the down syndrome where we can easily identify by the physical uh, features of the down syndrome congenital hypothyroidism any jaundice beyond 3 to 4 weeks you need to screen for thyroid and uh, you have to see for other associated problems of uh, congenital hypothyroidism and these three genetic disorders gilbert syndrome and krigler-najer 1 and 2 syndrome are uh, uh, diagnostic possibilities and if there is a blood group mismatch like ab or rh then ongoing hemolysis sometimes may lead to a, a prolonged jaundice in this age group and for the uh, uh, neonatal cholestasis of course it is it is to be uh, um, investigated very aggressively this is a very nice chart uh, that is to be uh, because the causes and the liver is at risk so you need to um, identify these babies early so whether you are dealing with a sick baby with a neonatal cholestasis or whether you are dealing a A healthy looking baby with a neonatal cholestasis so in a sick baby urine we need to check for reducing sugars we have to rule out galactosemia blood and urine cultures to rule out sepsis malarial parasites in the endemic areas tot serology of course and uh, inborn error of metabolism when babies were not sick then you have to look for the stool color for 3 days if there are pigmented stools are found then you need ultrasonography and liver biopsy for the neonatal uh, hepatitis and if there are pale stools then you need to investigate very urgently you uh, go for liver biopsy uh, ultrasonography and hida scan and if biliary atresia is diagnosed then you have to refer them for the uh, kasai's procedures thank you dr mohammed so it is important that babies who present with prolonged jaundice one differentiates between conjugated hypobilirubinemia and 
just prolongation of the unconjugated jaundice, as you highlighted very nicely, the causes of prolonged unconjugated jaundice. And if you find it is conjugated jaundice, then you follow that algorithm. We have not gone into detail of the conjugated hyperbilirubinemia because it is such a broad topic that it will consume its own time to discuss it. Uh, I think we are finished with the plant questions. Uh, and before I hand over back to Dr. Divyan, uh, so any of the panel member, panel members, if they think that any message they want to give, we have left anything to be discussed, uh, most welcome. And then Dr. Divyan can take over for the uh, chatted questions. Yes, sir. One clear message related to jaundice that breastfeeding is never ever is to be stopped because majority of the time it is linked with the maternal diet and it is stopped by the relatives. During phototherapy, it has been uh, guided by some of the, I mean, our staff also that you stop uh, breast milk and you keep the baby under phototherapy. So baby will be fine very early. So all these messages, because uh, jaundice and phototherapy is a time where the maximum lactation failures occur. So this is a time where we need to support breastfeeding. Dr. Orvi, anything you want to add? So just those babies who get early discharge, like normal delivered, vaginal delivered mothers. So they should be regularly followed up, counseled well that jaundice is a thing which needs to be checked on third or fifth day. So that I think should go up uh, overall that we should call them back by third or fifth day or any local uh, pediatrician who is nearby their house, they means they should go in that locality and get it checked if the hospital is far for them. Because even nowadays, Anganwadi workers are also getting trained to see for the jaundice. So regular follow-up and teaching of those workers should be done so that they can refer to the concerned pediatrician. Very important. Dr. Sridhar, anything you want to add? Uh, sir, uh, I would just like to say that we must follow what are standard of care and not uh, even, uh, accidentally encourage or uh, seem to uh, approve what, what are... Uh, maybe practices which are uh, prevalent or which may not really be useful, like for example, sunlight, uh, for example, the use of uh, alternative therapies. Now, there are many that uh, have uh, you know, tried a lot of herbal remedies. So, try and tell the parents that this is a very natural, very physiologic condition. But if there is a treatment that uh, requires to be given to the baby, it is uh, phototherapy and it may require hospitalization for a while. But today, we have effective, safe phototherapy. And not to delay treatment and not to seek uh, alternative uh, therapy. And like Dr. Uri rightly pointed out, recognize the high risk baby who may be at higher risk for uh, developing serious jaundice and uh, screen them well and call them up for follow up. If they're lost to follow up, make sure they know where to go for uh, a screening at the end of uh, a day, first day or a second day. Thank you. Thank you. Over to uh, Dr. Devyan, chairperson, if you want to ask questions from the chatted questions. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, any standard normogram used by experts for uh, hyperbilirubinemia? I think this was a uh, question was asked first when... Uh, uh, that was a given answer. Uh, any role of prophylactic phototherapy in extremely low birth weight baby? Uh, uh, so, I think, Dr. Shridhar, if you want to... Again, yeah, so, uh, sir, there is really no role for... Uh, prophylactic phototherapy, as we have seen, the values of uh, bilirubin at the begin uh, therapy are very clearly identified by some of these uh, charts, like the Maisel's chart, and more recently, the uh, curves which have been brought out by Pillay et al. And you must use a standard uh, guideline or a protocol in a given unit and be consistent with the use of that protocol. There is no role of prophylactic uh, phototherapy. Okay. Uh, there is a long question, but the crux of that is, uh, any role of phototherapy in second week of life? Yes, if we are suspecting like say breast milk jaundice, which is unconjugated form, we can give because we don't want to stop breastfeeding. So phototherapy can be of help in those cases. Even in premature babies like say borderline preterms, the 34, 35 weeker who can have prolonged jaundice till 12 to 14 days, we can give phototherapy in those babies. So, so uh, the need of phototherapy depends upon the level of unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. So, if it if it is high, then you need to give depending upon high how high it is. And this this stark example is babies you have Pigeon-Ager syndrome who persist to have very high bilirubin levels. So, phototherapy can be continuing them in months for months together. Only thing is, as skin gets thicker and thicker, 
effective also for therapy decreases uh there is one case scenario uh gravid had two full term lscs delivered baby mother have history of icd positive uh, mother blood group uh, is o negative cord blood taken and sent baby blood group uh, dct and serum bilirubin uh, baby blood group come b positive direct combs trace is positive and total bilirubin is 6.8 uh, that we are talking about cord blood bilirubin so now what should be ideal next line of management i think it was uh, previously told that extend transfusion but if anything new you want to end uh, sir uh, the the uh, important thing to remember is one you must look at the baby in uh, the entirety look at the uh, features of pala look at hepatotoxicity look at uh, maybe the availability of extend transfusion in your unit begin intensive phototherapy as early as possible and uh, in the time that you're waiting for the blood to arrive uh, for the extend transfusion make sure that your baby is getting uh, double maybe triple source intensive phototherapy with uh, all the precautions that you want to keep the light as close as possible to the baby and uh, maybe in a given situation if the baby appears well you may want maybe a repeat bilirubin just before you go ahead and do that extend transfusion to see if that value is actually rising and this is definitely uh, hemolysis this is rh hemolysis and uh, an exchange would be mandated an exchange would be mandated uh there is one question related to machine led machine that new led manufa machine manufacturer are claim that it's work up to 40000 hours is it true uh, sir the best of and my knowledge and even phonix also tell that it it can work up to 1 lakh hours One lakh hours. Yes. Ah, yeah. That is. Uh, that is. This are true or? Yes. Yes. Uh, it's true. Yeah. Yes, sir. Sir, please. please. May please you go ahead, sir. So uh, I think uh, we must follow the uh, manufacturer's instructions, and as uh, Dr. Deepak sir rightly brought out, we must ensure that we have a valid certificate of uh, an appropriate regulatory body, and it's not uh, you know fly-by-night company that is doing this uh, LED machine. Most LED machines would have. A shelf life of almost three to five uh, years. They do have a panel which tells you how many hours of use uh, have elapsed. So yes, some of these manufacturers uh, do claim efficacy till almost three to five years. Yes, but we have to check the flux periodically. Mm -hmm. So the message will be flux. If it is normal, it can be used till one lakh hours. One lakh hours. And that is fifteen. Yes. And if you are giving intensive, minimum fifteen at infant skin level. Yeah, infant skin. Yeah, but if you if you look at one like hours, uh, even if you use it twenty four hours, seven days throughout the year, it will be almost ten ten per week. So before the light source comes off, other parts of our therapy will become different. <laughs> uh, that actually means that it, till the machine is working, you keep on using it without changing the light. But it is important, as Dr. Muhammad is saying, to keep on checking flux. If you are using it for intensive, at least thirty. Uh, which type of exchange transfusion uh, is preferred central or peripheral doctor we sir it's always central is which is easy and obviously preferable peripheral if the baby comes late and the uh, umbilical line or cord has dried up and difficult to cannulate then we have no options and to go for the peripheral but obviously umbilical is always the preferred site because it is uh, okay comment on use of phototherapy blankets for the blankets if i may say the blankets can be used uh, and they have been used especially in small babies for example they are incubator uh, people have used during kmc the studies have shown that their effect is typically 50% of if you give as a as a full fledge for therapy for therapy so they can be used to enhance the effect of uh, single sub for therapy you add on from below us in my experience using billy blanket as an intensive phototherapy is very helpful to uh, because we have seen that baby who are near extend transfusions uh, will have the values very rapidly down uh now this is question from all of us mostly because we all are using are doing this practice also <laughs> a full term presenting with jaundice level within exchange range but no major risk factor apart from weight loss we all know this is because of dehydration only 
and uh, we expect it to improve uh, only this neonatal jaundice is the only thing when the child is getting admission in nisu we can say that yes your child will improve 100% so we expect that with giving a fluid and that uh, phototherapy the child is going to uh, improve so is it medical legally safe to wait for 6 to 8 hour so uh, i will try to give an answer so maybe there may be different answer to this but i will try to give an answer and let's see how the other panel member feels but if you look at ap recommendation it says that if baby presents to you with le- levels in 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 the range of exchange transfusion but without uh, le- any evidence of connectors then you can while you are arranging blood you can start for therapy and my year after 3 to 4 hours and if it is still high then you can go ahead with exchange transfusion if it has come down you can continue with for therapy on the other hand if baby is already under for therapy already admitted with you and the levels are rising and then they are reaching high levels then there is no point in repeating again after 4 hours because baby is already under for therapy that may be true for example babies with rh isomerization ab isomerization so in that case you have to straight away go ahead with exchange transfusion so if you apply this principle to your case scenario so i will say that for it will be perfectly right to uh, give fluid challenge because the baby has dehydration and baby has come from outside we expect that it will come down in 4 to 6 hours so it will be perfectly right to go ahead with intensive for therapy repeat after 4 hours and then see whether it will come down or not provided baby has no signs of connectors but it of course it is a it, now it is a shared decision you tell parents that this is what is recommended and we will follow this and most likely baby will respond but baby does not respond then you we have that uh, exchange transfusion is available but exchange transfusion has risk 1% risk of mortality 5% risk of infection or other complications so you have to have a discussion and then informed decision making has to be done okay. very rightly said sir even if we uh, decide to do exchange transfusion at that point preparing for the blood and cross matching will take at least 4 5 hours so by that time we can give intensive phototherapy and we can repeat and if it is rising yes we can order the blood Just to add one more thing to what uh, Deepak sir very nicely brought out, I think uh, having an objective bind score chart would also add to your decision making and also convince your parents that yes, at the moment the baby does not have any sign of bind, or it's just about one or two. And yes, uh, we may uh, in the next three hours, four hours have blood available. We will see if the bind score changes. There are any signs of equilibrium encephalopathy, then we will go ahead with. Uh, Yes, so medical legally the bind score is the thing which is most important okay uh, keep in mind almost all the questions we have taken any anyone left dr prashant no i think all questions covered harsha takwani sir is raising a hand if he wants uh, to say anything takwani sir takwani sir please unmute and say uh, ask the question maybe it's by mistake but then thank you so much to all the experts uh, today i mean it felt like we were uh, having a encyclopedia of jaundice all the topics were covered and for this nice i'm really to thankful to deepak chawla sir really sir you have made a scenarios in such a way that a to z of uh, jaundice is covered so thank you so much and nnf gujarat is happy to present a certificate of appreciation to you for moderating ses- uh, session such a, in a such a nice way also divyang for being a chairperson and to our panelists dr g shridhar sir dr urvi sangvi and dr mohammad gandhi you all have uh, justified the topic and let me tell you that apart from the zoom there were around 29 participants on youtube also i mean they were on youtube they were sending the messages so uh, great discussion sir once again thank you so much and our next neonatal patchala will be on next wednesday at 3:30 pm with uh, 